Hello, everybody. Welcome to Sacred Hospitality with Orland Bishop. This is our second presentation or session together in this special sequence. Uh, the pleasure of hosting Orland with us uh, across two programs, across time and space, with the Lit Forums and with Applied Anthroposophy as part of Anthrop the Anthroposophical Society in America. My name is Tess Parker. I'm the Director of Programs for the Anthroposophical Society in America, and I am uh, the, I have the pleasure of being in a team of folks putting together the Applied Anthroposophy course, which uh, this this presentation tonight is part of that course. Um, and we do have it, the registration will remain open for those still deciding, for those who have not heard and want to learn more. Uh, we'll have some time at the end of the session tonight where you can ask questions. We'll have about 15 minutes, so stay on after. If you have questions about this course that unfolds through um, different highlights from the anthroposophical movement, ways of applying anthroposophy, ways of applying research in the world, gathering with people uh, across the nation, across and internationally as well, who are working to bring spiritual research into their reality of everyday life. So we do hope you'll consider um, and be interested in, in continuing on. Uh, so, and also welcome to those of you who are in the course. We're so glad you're here and we're so glad you're welcoming and opening the doors uh, tonight for such a um, broad expanse of, of individuals. Uh, so just lots and lots of gratitude. I'm feeling my heart opening as I open this Zoom room. Uh, it's just, I can, I feel like I'm already part of some energy that was created yesterday and uh, I'm just very humbled to experience it with you all. And I'm going to pass it over to our friend, Angela Foster, who is another Applied Anthroposophy host and guide. Um, and she'll lead us through um, just a grounding opening uh, moment. Thank you. Thank you, Tess. And yeah, I'm excited to see everybody too. People still coming in, so welcome. And if you're watching this recording in the future, we acknowledge you. Thank you for joining us. Um, in the Applied Anthroposophy course this year, we have begun a practice um, following an example set by an American scientist and artist, researcher and teacher who was a contemporary of Rudolf Steiner and his name was George Washington Carver. And George Washington Carver had this practice and um, ability to attend to the natural world in such a way that he could talk with the natural world. It said that he could talk with flowers. So what we're going to do this in this course this year is every time we come together in these Wednesday night calls, we'll spend a few minutes turning our collective attention for two or three minutes to a particular plant or flower. And tonight, we're going to turn our attention to rosemary. So we have a little picture of rosemary coming up with a bumblebee, or that's a honeybee, yeah, with a honeybee. And um, maybe you have some rosemary with you. And if you don't, maybe this week you can keep your eyes open and see if any rosemary comes your way. So tonight we'll say hello to this being of rosemary. It's an evergreen plant that's used in cooking and used for medicine and um, in ritual work, in ancient times, even up to the present day, rosemary can be found as an integral part of funeral practice. Um, the oils can be transformed into salves and ointments, tinctures and teas. Um, part of the fun with this project of attending to a flower each week is getting to do research and explore what, everything I can about these flowers. And then the hard part is essentializing it. So 
today I was really working, okay, if I had to say one word for rosemary, what would it be? And that word is concentration. This plant takes the forces of its fragrance and its warmth and draws it inward. And rather than creating broad leaves and a thick stem, it creates the form that you can see here on your screen, or maybe you have one in your hand. This, this holding back or drawing inward of its forces into a concentration. And then holding that picture of the rosemary plant concentrating, we can begin to um, understand why throughout human history, rosemary has been associated with memory and with remembrance. Um, in ancient Greek schools, uh, they made garlands out of rosemary and wore them as crowns sometimes when they were studying. And it's said that they burned uh, rosemary incense or stems of rosemary to help as a, as a learning aid to help them study. So we can think about rosemary um, helping us as human beings to, to, to develop our capacity for remembering. And especially tonight, I wondered why, why rosemary tonight? And when I thought about our friend Orland, who's going to speak with us, many times when I've heard Orland speak, I hear him ask us to remember, to um, remember who we are and where we've come from. And with a special remembrance to our ancestors and the ancestral realm. So with that, we'll say hello to the rosemary plant and ask for her help in the sacred act of remembering. And I'll pass it over to you, my friend, Jordan. Thank you, Angela. That's gonna be, that's gonna be so, so sweet to make friends with a different plant and flower each of our sessions together throughout this program i'm really looking forward to that i could i could feel a deeper a deeper connection right and um and that is ultimately if i had to concentrate uh this course applied anthroposophy down into one word it might be something like connection and this is the third year, we're beginning the third year of this Applied Anthroposophy course, which has happened online and has been more than any of us could imagine. And Orlin Bishop has been there very early on each year. He's a good, good friend of this program. And, and maybe that's what I could say about Orland as, as far as introductions go, is, is this quality of of recognizing of of attending certainly but of really recognizing paying attention and befriending like what does it mean to befriend the world to befriend another human being but and to befriend ourselves um, so the quality of listening that we endeavor to practice here together and that angela brought us just what can happen, how we can um, sacralize the world when we just pay attention, when we just seek the friendship that is all around us. And so we are very honored to have our good friend Orlin Bishop with us once again, offering the way he does himself and his listening and his attention to us. So thank you, Orlin, for being here. Oh, I am so happy to share this invitation for us to all be together. Uh, greetings, beloved friends. Happy to be on this call again today, a different time because we hosted yesterday for those who are in a different part of the world that may need the hours to be able to stay up and share this communion. Today, I think we are more within the American stream of time, 
And this is also for me a critical um, awareness to see how we share community. At what hours of the day are we in touch with the wakefulness of our collective reality of relationships and whose thinking inspires the flow of energy between this network of conscious beings. It's, it's such a, an important awareness to know that where we are in the world, are we holding a matrix of reality influencing one another in a certain kind of ecology. And this is really part of my, my intentions for today to talk a little bit about the ecologies within consciousness that allows us to um, inhabit the reality as it becomes and why it's really important to know when we are awake, what is influencing our awakeness. And then when we're asleep, what other things influence our um, sleep reality? But in this wakefulness, in this silence, as we give attention to the invitation to look at sacred hospitality in relationship to applied anthroposophy and the intention of cultivating leadership for our time. And I was asking, you know, I, I often give myself a question or a riddle or something to go into meditation with to ask those who are witnessing us in this manifested world, um, what is it that they would like us to know of this time? What is it that might even be at the higher reaches of our, of our superconscious that we are capable of reflecting into and bringing down into some deed between and among us. And whether we know that this current age, this cultural age that we are in, probably leads to the most significant conscious change that humanity may have ever gone through. Meaning we have encountered all the difficulties that could lead us to ask the question, how do we get out of this one? How do we change the patterns of this manifested cultural phenomena and return to the creative space is where we could then truly engage in harmonizing our collective potential for a better reality or actually a more shared reality, which ultimately will be better if we share it. But the critical thing is how do we enter into a shared reality to be able to then to harmonize our collective knowledge, experiences, and will as a leadership intention. Um, most societies had some initiation that led people into the awareness of the super sensible world, whether it's the world of the ancestors or as Angela was sharing, the world of nature. And these two realities, the world of the ancestors and the world of nature, helped humanity codify doctrines of understanding and beliefs that led to the establishment of particular practices that kept that time evolving. Modernity, however, reached a point in which we were just inheriting so much of what came before without practicing into the initiation of our will to be conscious of what is influencing what in our world. When we are awake, what forces enter into consciousness. So by the time we enter into modernity, 
we were being influenced by all manner of realities that we were not conscious of. And leadership took an unconscious, unconscious form of engagement. And people just felt I can do whatever I want to do with my will and ultimately with other people's will when they begin to enslave other people to achieve other levels of reality without contributing real love for that reality. So I'm, I'm, I'm going into a stream of consciousness to share what I will share today. Sometimes we say it's the American stream, but it's also one can say the Western stream. What was lost in the transition of consciousness into the epoch known as the Western epoch of civilization, whereby the lesser mysteries became great, more engaged than the greater mysteries. The lesser mysteries being doctrines of belief that only interacted with the finished world the manifested world in which people could count things, measure things, distribute things, and call it reality. And the source of the very consciousness that is looking at the world, there was no training for that. At least or the training became diminished to the degree in which um, the powers were being accumulated more towards um, the things that were already finished. And consciousness can then decide how to govern that. What remained available is the healing, the healing knowledge, which has always been preserved by some, in some measure, by a group or individuals who understood how to maintain the communication towards the greater mystery and when to, when to re-infuse that into the culture so that we can begin to ask again, how do we reform our day-to-day uh, -day lives and bring attention up and into these higher inspirations so that we can be guided by the intelligence that are still trying to heal consciousness. And healing is a, a consequence of the esoteric tradition, meaning that people were able to discover subtler forces that can transform and transmute what was already able to be perceived and guide that energy towards the objective space and transmute it. This was, has always been the theory of magic within all traditions that understood that if you could direct energy through attentiveness to some objective field, that field will respond in revealing its wisdom, revealing its potentiality, and becoming harmonized to the guidance of those who are able to interact with its integrity, with its language, with its codes, with its mystery, just like Angela shared about George Washington Carver. What it, what it would mean to be able to come into awareness of the profound communication fields within the human being's capacity for bringing reality into harmonic. And this is really why I feel like in this American age, 
in an age in which humanity meets at the threshold of so much difference and indifference. Those realities above and beyond our current mind states are imploring. They're in a certain way trying to find the, the moment when we could aspire for a dream, for an ideal, an idea that can bring our consciousness back to the inherent esoteric conscious space the hiddenness in us, the soul. And so what, what kind of leadership is important for the American soul, for the American age in which the soul has to redeem its free forces and rededicate that to the principles of development inherent in all esoteric traditions. And so after a hundred plus years, anthroposophy has been giving guidance to human development for the purpose of uniting us with the super sensible realm. And it's one of many, say, ways of knowing that still flows through human consciousness. And for my life, I can say I move between this stream of, of, of initiatives and initiation and the African Gnostic streams of initiatives and initiation and ask myself what, where, where or when will they converge for, the, for the, the critical issues around the, um, the reconciliation that must happen for our world to move beyond these historical um, conflicts. I've had the privilege of being with um, one of those African um, elders whose wisdom reached the Akashic field and where he could speak from the limitless memory that surrounds our planet. That what we call our atmosphere on one level is the magnetic, electromagnetic processes that create for us the elements that allows our own organism and life organisms on this planet to live. And beyond that is the other realm where it's not dependent upon the organism as it is expressed in the physical form, but still the communication field are extended into the ancestral realm and into the realms of other beings of light intelligence. These streams that connect to humanity on the physical plane still exist as guidance towards um, the futures that we are to become aware of. The potentiality. Again, here I'm not speaking of future as more time because outside of this atmosphere, time is eternal. The atmosphere is conditional for a reason. Our environment was created to support a certain type of cognition. And we've reached a certain um, optimization of the intellectual form of cognition. And now we have to go to the soul level of cognition that holds a certain additional propensity towards the sacred and towards a higher recollection of what 
is truly available for the human being's creative act. So this form of communication I'm sharing with you is called Endaba. It's, it's out of the Zulu tradition for which I was um, invited, from which I was invited to share. It's resonating with a communication that is trying to communicate us into an agreement, into a yes. So it is within a certain measure of, of life energy to find patterns, like life energy tries to find patterns that can create coherence, cause ecologies. It, it wants people who have the potential to share something to find each other. And what form of knowledge will allow us to agree that we found each other in the reality in which our agreement could actually utilize this tremendous power of cognitive creation. I hope you're following. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to take it slowly into the streaming of something above the intellectual um, activities that inhabit this planet. Because George Washington Carver did not go into that realm only for the teachings that he facilitated at Tuskegee. You know, he went into a realm within the meditative cognitive space, many others as well. Harriet Tubman, you know, she led people to freedom beyond the running away from slavery. She led them into the cognition of a certain virtue that the stars can guide you. They know your destiny better than you do. Let the stars take you through the darkness. So there were many kinds of um, individualities whose knowledge kept the African Gnostic stream alive in the American experience. And they did not, they may have lost the physical reality of their time, but not the knowledge of their time. The forms will transfer and transition and transform all the time. But one thing remains consistent is the knowledge that can open the door to remembering. This age gives us access to the esoteric training that could support human beings being able to think in a certain way together and harmonize this planet's vibrancy to be able to host in a very sacred way the beings who's this, who would like to enter into a relationship with us for this particular age that is ahead of us, the age of humanity, the age in which this human form can take on higher substances, vibratory substances, and as a result of that, higher intuitional capacity for bringing the planet out of its suffering. This is what we're calling applied anthropocity. Where is it applied? To human consciousness. It's about the human being. It's about our place, role, and time in world evolution. And it's for us to stop blocking the light from reaching the planet. The sun does not just come to shine light on 
the sun is an abode in for the soul and its memory for the soul to organize its capacity to bring into manifestation certain potentialities. So yes, when we're in sleep, our soul does something very different with the sun and what the body does when we're awake. And we weave this stream of consciousness into our planet's destiny in crossing between the ecologies of nature every time we sleep and awake and then inhabit our bodies again we potentize the planet's readiness for initiation, our initiation. But if we don't wake up knowing I'm prepared for something, uh, we don't exercise this development. And so I'm really inviting us to consider that this it, attention that you're giving can not just go to what I say, but to go to the source that inspires me to say it and ask yourselves, is there, are there ways of knowing that does not have to depend on information? Because the soul knows, and it's not information. The soul doesn't know because of information. The soul knows because of energy. vibrational intelligence that goes between beings within the ecologies of nature and beyond within the cosmos. The soul is interacting and asking, what patterns do I co-create to be able to recognize a community of practice? community that will allow and agree for the right use of secret intelligence. And I think our intention to host these spaces is really not to just pass information around. That helps to know what we're thinking and why. But how, how to be a host for the very thing that gives us the identity and the community and the accessibility to other states of being. And we want to really support what human beings are striving to do within their own individuality, but within the various communities that we interact with. And at this stage in, in, in the evolution of Western empiricism in consciousness, meaning we can know why we know the things we know. We, we can actually say to, to ourselves, this knowledge that I um, exercise thinking around and what gives me access to the things I do in the world, this knowledge has reached a certain point of knowing that someone else's knowledge will cause conflict with mine. So we know who else thinks differently and what that causes in, in my life in the world, right? We know all the paradigms that causes conflict in the world. We know them. Meaning that they, 
the, the very forces that revealed their creativity to us, that made the intellect, the intellectual schools be developed, the various um, uh, traditions, that initiated the mind to be so accomplished. These very archetypes are giving something different to the heart. It's actually giving almost the opposite to the heart. It's not giving knowledge and information the way we received it before. It's giving us another relationship. The heart chooses someone that probably will give us the hardest time in our life and say, love that person. Transmute that idea. Find a way to understand why that person thinks the way they do. Not just say, I disagree with you, but to say, let me, let me try to understand why you're thinking that way. Can I enter into a shared understanding of the reality that you see so clearly as future? It used to be called diplomacy. I don't know if they do it anymore. It probably doesn't serve much in some contexts. But diplomacy was a training to really understand the cognitive dissidence between people. You know, the human rights work came out of studying how do we get people who disagree so much to agree on one thing the human being must develop. This all came out of Second World War. Let us agree that development must happen. Because it was revealed who was thinking what that caused all the conflict. And not just the everyday thinking, they went as far as understanding the esoteric thinking behind these wars. They knew how far back the war started. And realized that if we don't develop certain uh, ways of knowing and being, the war will be far more intense the next time. And so the protections were put in place through diplomacy to go around the world and create some agreements, not about the things that most people think people are fighting over, but a consciousness, the space where a person is likely to be corrupted by things far beyond their power of control. The human being is vulnerable, you know, vulnerable to corruption. And mostly because we love an idea so much, we can love an idea so much that we don't want to share it. Or that someone else must give up their, their way of knowing. It's idealism. That was trapped, idealism that was trapped in religion and so many other ways of tradition. that I know the way to the stars. And if you just follow me, everybody will be free. And anthroposophy brings another possibility. A philosophy of freedom, a philosophy that frees, not 
the idea to be shared, but free the idealist. To give the human being a way of knowing the human being. In all aspects, you can know your unconscious, you can know the conscious, and you can know the superconscious. You can know the higher world. You can know how to suspend judgment about the past and enter into a relationship now for the future. We, we have within the last hundred years, the corrective pedagogy for what assaulted the human consciousness in some of the primordial ages of human development and could rectify it now with a scientific methodology of observation of everything that passes through our will. In surveying, this field of anthroposophy, and it's a critical thing to understand and why it's not so much about the content around things and the powers that human being can have in the realm of magic and mystery, because it's always been a temptation to learn something because I want to affect the world in a certain way. Here is a knowledge that gives you access to freedom. The more you study it, the more free of the temptations we become. The more free we become able to love. The more free we be able to listen into the true wisdom of the mysteries. And peel away all the boundaries between nature, ancestor, and cosmos and live within the true sacred hospitality that governs every realm of existence. And what if this, what if this is our true age, this being our true culture? To find reverence for it and the inner decisions of how to go towards this harmonic vibrancy where our light intelligence interacts more with our body and the impulses of our external deeds that we fulfill every day in our work life. So people ask, well, how do we do that? Well, uh, thus whatever, read some of Steiner's things, <laughs> books and go to the study groups and engage, but also this, this is really for me, accept, accept who we are. There's some acceptances that just starts with even the things that are invisible. Uh, I accept that there is some being hosting my development. I don't know how to recognize it yet. But this is a critical thing that made the human rights work solidify. They accepted that there were invisible guidance to human life. And that no government supersedes that. No parent supersedes that. No profession supersedes that. So it gives the human being back the right to belong to a sacred reality.
Secondly, the agreements held the space to say, people must be able to move freely to find a community of belonging for their higher purpose. Well, immigration is affecting that. Because again, people think people just want to go from one country to the next. No, you want to go from one ecology to the next. The ecology in this continent of North America is not because of America. The ecology is here because of the potential for what Americans can become. It's not because we name it that it works. The world is in motion energetically for the human heart to host something of the next age. And it's important that we go back to the very principles of human development and ask, how do I host the world evolution through the relationships that come to me in inspiration, in imagination, in intuition, and in travel? Because everyone is sleeping and waking into the greater mysteries every day and really looking for a host for the full memory that we sometimes have to forget just to belong to the world as it is. But the soul is trying to sing a new song and find the right poetry and find the right articulation of the relationships it's seeking to be able to engage the higher mysteries again. And bring us out of scarcity. Everywhere you can hear those communications and one can experience those vibrations of the planet's calling towards its hosts and the inner soul of others crying out for its host. I, I brought back this idea of sacred hospitality it was not is not new i took it up after i started to write the book seven shrine because it was time it was time again to uh, choose how to make these futures more cognizable and recognizable to people who feel it inwardly in the heart and know it through their own inner striving, but require some framework of intention to call it forth, to awake it and to nourish it. And so I'm glad that these um, efforts are being made by the uh, World Social Initiative Forum and the Applied Anthroposophy practice in the anthroposophical society here in America and uh, through this community of friends who depend on each other's inner strength every day for the light that we share and the love that we share. So in whatever way I could be of service to this ongoing effort, you know I'm here. And um, Tess, Angela, and Jordan, thank you for hosting us today. And I'll turn it over to you again. Thank you, everyone.
a gift to be able to host you and to you know welcome your almost tuning and harmonizing presence to this group to be able to enter that shared reality so i appreciate this moment to kind of invoke the beginning of our course um, our year-long journey in learning how to harmonize and work with these practices in our inner lives so thank you for that very inspirational meaningful sharing to help us find our way and in a moment i guess my sound is not so strong i'm sorry about that um in a moment we will close and for those of you who wish to stay on and hear more about our year-long course uh, we'd love you to, to stay on we have different uh, ways of engaging with the course uh, different levels to join depending on your schedule or interests um, and we would love to answer any questions and, and welcome you into this community um, it's now in its third year a very strong uh, community has built amongst past participants current participants and the guides so it's it's a very um, beautiful experience and we hope you will take the time to consider that um, and I will um, now turn it over to Angela and Jordan who can help close our space together tonight hmm. thank you thank you Orland <laughs> so in the time we have left I'm going to invite everyone to find a distillation and an essential word from what is reverberating and resonating in you right now. There's no rush. There's plenty of time. But we'll, Angela and I will show, share a little reflection poem, and we'll be sure to finish with a few minutes of silence. And in that silence, if everyone wants to enter into the chat, their, their one word that would, together we will create a social poem here. But first, as reflection, we're going to offer Orland back to him some of what is this, resounding for Angela and I. I belong to a sacred reality. Doors opening to remember. Invisible guidance. There is a being hosting my development. Stars guiding us through the darkness. A knowledge that gives access to freedom. Knowledge that has kept time evolving we can know why we know the things that we know you can we can unite with a way of knowing if if we stop blocking the light We recognize a community that agrees. Where, when will they converge for reconciliation?
the heart chooses. I can do whatever I want with my will. Not content, not power through magic or mystery, but more freedom to listen, more free to love. I belong to a sacred reality. I belong to a sacred reality. And there's so many powerful words being typed into the chat. So we'll collect those and, and add them to the ongoing social poetry. I feel like I'm basking in this field that you've created. And thank you again, Orland, for being a part of that and really teaming up again in this. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. So grateful. And I think now we can transition. So we'll, those who wish to pop off, uh, those who wish to stay, please do. And um, yeah, until next time, thank you for joining this program tonight. And um, and yesterday, those of you who were there and um, really being a part of this moment in time, I really appreciate you showing up and uh, you're, you're bringing your will to this and your activity and attention and consciousness and love. That is really just so important in this time. So um, I really feel all of you and I appreciate all of you and uh, good night. Thank you. <laughs>